Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we're back. This is, I believe, episode three, if you're following along sequentially uh, in our time travel series. And so hopefully you're traveling with us in the proper sequence. We'll, we'll talk more about that in a minute because that aligns with the theory, one of the theories better. But we are this in the midst of a nerd culture and Christian in Christ series. And we focused here initially on time travel and more importantly, how literature, movies, TV shows, whatever, pulp fiction, whatever, what have you that discusses time travel and how it informs our understanding of God the nature of God and God's relationship with time. And so I, again, I'm Rob Sullivan, professor of political science. So I'm probably out of my element here, uh, as well as Dean of the humanities and social sciences at Dallas Baptist university. And I am joined by Paul Carby and Paul, if you want to, again, just tell everyone a little bit more about yourself. Absolutely. My name is Paul Carby. Like you said, I'm a former professor of philosophy there at DBU, as well as a minister to students in a church in St. Louis, and also a PhD student uh, specializing in medieval Christian philosophy. Awesome. Good stuff. Good stuff. So, so Paul's, Paul's the man with this stuff. So uh, Professor, Professor Carby, what we've done thus far, the ground that we have covered, the time that we have traveled has been mostly on the nerd side of things, right? right. We've, yes. we've said we, we, we created this, uh, or we, we didn't create, we explained the two theories of time and the two theories of God's relationship with time for lack of a better phrase. Right. Yes. And we developed, uh, we explained the a version and the B version, also known as the dynamic versus the static version. Um, one, the A, basically, there is, um, there's just the now, the present. And you can, and please exp expand upon my understanding as, as, as needed, but there's the A where there is no uh, future or past. Uh, there's no set time. If we had a, created a time machine and gave it a GPS, which certainly they'd have something like that, right. To go where they yeah. want. If, yes. if it's, whether it's, whether it's a DeLorean uh, with the flux capacitor and you set it to 1955 or 1985, or like we said, the TARDIS with Dr. Who, where it's just all uh, these, you, you do the same thing, but maybe it's a little more precise. I don't know because it wasn't a failed uh, sports car, um, but <laughs> you have, you have this, this set time. It won't, it won't go anywhere with, with, with uh theory a um right but but theory e theory b says that and there is there is this plane of time this timeline and god is present in all of those and and we see you know we see the the, the disciples as you know two thousand years ago what have you is this ancient time where it, it's there's this timeless mindset that god has and right. so there is so at least in theory uh the b theory offers the possibility of time travel from a nerd aspect right <laughs> so there's a plausibility to it very incoherent or, or in, you know probably impossible but still uh, plausible right and so the whole point, again, the whole point of this is, is great. You know, we know it'd be fun to just discuss all these things, these nerd, these uh, nerd culture artifacts that we love. And each of us have our own um, area that we like to dwell in. You know, you like fiction. There's some science fiction I like. There's also, I've also mentioned the Twilight Zone and some of those really, I don't know where that falls in <laughs> inside the spectrum, right. uh, but uh, there's, um, it's important to note that as you'll mention, any sort of science fiction uh, thoughts of time travel are, are only available in, in the, the B or static theory. Um, but now uh, we've, we've made, we've laid that groundwork and today we're probably going to, we're going to do some more scriptural and theological 
heavy lifting, if you will. Right. And so, yeah. yeah. And so you have some verses for us and you have, you're able to unpack those verses and connect them with the theories. Uh, and just to clarify, we're, we're start, we're going to have, this is, we're going to have two parts to this, this, this episode, we're going to unpack uh, the theological aspects of a, of the a theory or the dynamic theory. And then next episode, episode four, we're going to unpack B. So why don't you go ahead and tell us, uh, give us some of the verses you've uh, researched and kind of make that connection. Absolutely. Yeah. And just so I'll probably mention this in our next episode as well, but just to kind of make sure for everyone out there listening that we have the main component, I think that, or what I think to be the main component in mind is the aspect of God's existence in terms of what he knows, what he is, and at what stage does he know and, and, and exist. Um, this is really kind of the, the bedrock ground that we're going to be talking about. Um, and you'll see the differences that they develop. So this is all about the A theory, the dynamic theory of time, dynamic because it it has an understanding that time flows similar to, as we would say, time flows like a river. And, and the good way to think about this in really just practical terms is if you were standing, <clears throat> excuse me, beside a river and you know that God is standing next to you and both of you have your vision locked in one specific place. It can't look to the right or the left. You just have your vision and that's all you see of the river. Uh, now imagine, you know, leaves float into your vision and float out of your vision. For all you know, those leaves didn't exist before and they definitely don't exist after. You really have no conception of whether they exist before or after. Or water moccasins. Or water moccasins or ducks or any, yeah. any other crazy things that would float in and out. But you know that while they're in your field of vision, they are existent. That's, that's what's important to you. That's very similar to how the A theory looks at this flow of time. Things come into existence and potentially out of existence as, as moments, what we call become and regress. And God is standing there with you experiencing the same thing. So every new moment uh, in what we consider this sequential order is ontologically new for God. Um, now, in this uh, like I said, we have some biblical verses that at least lend us to this. And, and obviously, as a philosopher and, and as a thinker on time, these degrees are sorry, these uh, theories like we talked about last time are, are binary. They're definitely uh, irreconcilable. So you kind of have to fall in one camp or the other. So I do obviously have my beliefs on it, but I'm going to try to be charitable to both views so that we can let your listeners kind of develop their own thinking on it. That's um, that sounds great. Uh, just before we we get knee deep into the verses, uh, maybe you can remind folks. Uh, in previous episodes, we've discussed or defined ontological approaches. Uh, if you want to yes. just kind of, since you know, not everyone's <laughs> a philosopher, um, but yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah. So so just saying ontological means it, when we relate to existence. So if something is you know related to its ontology, it means its existence. Um, right. so yeah, so th those words, you can kind of just make synonymous, um, and that for our discussion. So a good way to look at this. So one good verse to think about would be like second Corinthians six, two, uh, Paul writes, uh, for he says in a favorable time, I listened to you and in a day of salvation, I have helped you behold. Now is the favorable time behold. Now is the day of salvation. So we have this concept that it seems like Paul is playing with where Paul, where God speaking to his people saying that there is a time in which I have listened to you. Notice the, the tensed language. I have listened or I listened past tense to you and in a day of salvation, right? In, in a day to come, I have helped you or I will help you. Um, <clears throat> behold, now, Paul is saying, now is that time. Now is that day. So we have this, even in one verse, we kind of have these three different tenses that we're talking about. And so that's the A theory of time, really in a nutshell. God knows and utilizes tensed facts, tensed being past, present, and future tense. Um, <clears throat> another verse that's, I think, really 
indicative of this is where we have in Proverbs 27, 1, do not boast about tomorrow, for we do not know what a new day may bring. This idea that today is now, don't worry about tomorrow. <laughs> it hasn't come into existence yet. It hasn't brought itself in yet. Um, so th these are these are some really good in, uh, indicative verses. There's one more. Um, uh, actually, there's several more, but I'm only going to take time for maybe one more. Uh, uh, let's look at Romans 13, 11. That's another good one. Um, besides, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. So Paul, again, talking about this a uh, seeming flow of time. Um, so the Bible actually, I mean, it, it does have some reference to this. And I think that it's important to remember that humans, we view things unidirectionally, right? We have to, right. right. We know we get older. We, we, uh, I remember the day my daughter was born. She's now 13. Yeah. That's She's a vastly different <laughs> entity than she was then as she is now. And, and we also have to remember, um, and I'll mention this again next time, but what is time? You know, that's another important thing to distinguish. Time is, I think a good working definition for us would be time is just the observance of what is a sequential change. You know, we observe changes. Like I said, the daughter I had when she was born is definitely not the daughter I have now. There seems to be a sequential change. And so what Paul seems to be uh, alluding to here, and even the writer of the Proverbs um, alluding to here, is that there seems to be a perceived sequential change from things as we see them. They, they move, they, they adjust, they become different seasons cycle through it rains one day and doesn't in that other um so this is really like i said at the heart of the a theory now there are different ways um within the a theory range there are actually a couple of different views um the b theory is a little different but we'll get to that in, a, in next episode but in a theory there seems to be a couple of prevalent views and and these are actually held um like I said, in the current philosophical world, okay. especially in the philosophy of religion world, it seems like the A theory is kind of leading the pack right now. Um, it seems to be the prevailing view. Um, but like William Lane Craig is a, is a big proponent of the A theory. He has a different idea on it, and I'll talk about his in just a second. Um but one of the more extreme versions of this, it'd be the view of presentism, meaning that all that exists is this, as we said, ontological present, this yeah. existent present. The, the um, leaves and the snakes and whatever you see in front of you is the only thing that exists right now. Nothing absolutely. behind, nothing coming. And that, and that, and it, it sounds like you're telling me that's even God's experience as well. Absolutely. Yes. Okay. Okay. Um, now, this is not to take into account memories, but memories of a snake or a leaf or things like that are not the snake leaf object. They're not the same, right? They are right. different. Um, right. So we can't say, well, I have the memory of it. Well, a presentist would say that doesn't matter. Your memory of it is not the thing itself. For okay. all you know, that thing no longer exists. It didn't exist before and it doesn't exist after. Um, there are now that that's a pretty extreme, I, I say extreme version of that. I mean, cause it pretty much limits what exists simply to what is objectively now. Um, that sounds kind of, um, uh, Lockean, uh, perhaps John, very empirical, very yeah, it, it, it definitely. Yeah. I see. Yeah. In, in that way, it definitely is what I can see and perceive right in the moment whatever that moment is, would be what is existent. Um, now, that is not to say that there's a whole different uh, ways this tangles out with how right. things seem to exist from moment to moment. And the fact that like you and I have been talking for a few moments now, how do I and you both exist moment to moment right. to moment? And, totally and that's, different. and of course, that's a different um, 
that's a different conversation that we could have about how we perceive the world and how we perceive time and how we perceive phenomena and how that helps structure like, like your, your 13 year old daughter, how things that she perceived and saw when she was maybe not as a baby, but five or six, how that influences what she thinks of the world now and how she encounters it and, and whatnot, but yeah, kind of a different conversation, but it still seems somewhat in, in line. So go ahead. Absolutely. So the other two kind of views associated with A are what's called the growing block and one called the moving spotlight or dubbed the moving spot spotlight. So the growing block tries to make sense of the fact that moments that have happened should still have some sense of existence because they are written history. But it doesn't want to bite the bullet and say that the future exists. It wants to deny that future moments exist in any way, shape, or form. Um, So essentially where we are is in the growing block idea, we are on the leading edge of existence. Everything else past us has some sense of reality, but there is no beyond us. We're we're literally kind of like, you know, to infinity and beyond, we are are pushing that leading edge of existence further um, as we go forward in time. The moving spotlight wants to get a little closer to the static view. It wants to look at things in terms of there could be this space-time manifold. There could be an existent future and an existent past, but it says they're really not significant. What matters is think about like a, like a big spotlight, right? There could be more in the room, but all we see and all we care about is what is in that spotlight, the present as we experience it. Um, Again, some of these are a little more incoherent. They're not as prevalent or popular. Um, Presentism or some form of presentism is kind of the idea. Now, Craig, I wanted to come back and cycle back to him because he's one of the big mouthpieces kind of in the the world right now, philosophy of religion. Craig has an idea, he is an atheist, but he, he has an interesting idea that when God came in when God created, he entered in willingly to a time schema. So kind of like uh, in Titus 1, 2, he, he talks, uh, Titus talks about how God, uh, before he created, he, he said he never lied, his promise before the ages began at the proper time manifested his word. So there was this eternality of God before But when God created, now he willingly stepped into an existence of sequential moments of time. So that's that's definitely a little bit of a different, more modified A, but it truly is an A theory because now God, regardless of what happened before, God is now lockstep in this existence as we move forward. So, But when he created things, he he stepped into, like he, but he didn't create time. It was already there and well well, i think we have to be careful uh when we talk about god creating time because i think by saying that we inadvertently start painting ourselves in a corner if we start saying god created time now it becomes this thing that god really either feeds or sustains or something like that and then you know on the B theory, like we talked about last time, we'll talk about next episode. God is timeless. Well, that, how does God react with time? It, you know, so that it, it, the language at times kind of can belie, belie our own thoughts. We just got to be careful with that. But I, I definitely see what you're saying, but I want to go back to the working definition. And that is time is the perceived existence of sequential change. God didn't create the perceived existence of sequential change. That is our observation of that. Okay. Okay. And and so I think that there are mechanisms that God created that show change, right? The the change is what maybe God created. Um, But a timeless being, and and we're getting a little debased, I don't want to get too far off on this, but a timeless being potentially could set that up. However, under a theory, going back to the subject at hand, that would absolutely be something that a tensed being would experience, especially God uh, uh, being as powerful as God. Um, he could create both the mechanisms 
and the actuality of that change as it moved through. Okay. Now, real quick, um, one question that's starting to reverb through my head, um, which maybe I just haven't had enough coffee, but the the s I guess the essence of time is kind of, is kind of critical here. During the, during this during our discussions during this little mini series, I guess if you want to call it series within a series, have we? I guess I guess in, what we're trying to do in also breaking down, if you will, or unpacking the nature of God, we're also trying to get a, get our heads around the essence of time, too. And we always assume that everything that exists, God created, and time is one of those. But there's also the, th- the belief that maybe time is just a man-made construct, and there's not really our sense that of time and time passing is maybe not as eternal as we, we think it is. Um, does that, do you see where I'm kind of going, getting at here? What, I, I think how, I did, how do we yeah. define, how do we describe, you know, and, and understand the essence of time? Well, I, I think we can look at it this way. Um, and maybe this will answer your question. I hope I'm answering your question. Sure, sure. For example, God created tigers, right? God created this object, this object, this existent thing that, and we picture in our mind to be a tiger, but did God create the concept of tiger and the name tiger, or did we see this object that God created and then in our minds identified it in such a way? I would say that the concept and the name obviously was identified in a, in a way that is unique to us as creation. That doesn't deny God's existence or creation of the object. He just I mean, it, it got like you know, the Bible says in Genesis, Adam named the creatures, right? Um, Adam named all living things. He had dominion yeah. over all these things. So God, I think, could easily have created the mechanism for the sequential change, but it's our concept of it okay. that has been unique to humanity. Right. I get a lot of that depends on whether you're talking about the large cat or the golfer. Uh, you're yeah. talking, I didn't, I didn't, I'm trying because I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, that both are unique, obviously. Right. Okay. Okay. So that, that helps, that helps. And that we understand that there's this, this, there is this exists, this entity called time that God created that we we try to get our head around and measure and, and whatnot and right. give it a name and yeah okay that makes sense that makes sense great good stuff heavy stuff now uh i think final question we'll probably ask these both in a and b how does this what does this tell us not just about the nature of god because i think we've kind of unpacked that but our relationship with god our relationship with eternity and our mission as christians um and uh, connecting with the lost world and anything of that nature that any evangelical or mission-based entities and also just our calling too. Maybe yeah, that's yeah. the best way to put it. How does it, what does it tell us about our calling and our God, Christ-given calling? That's probably the best way to, to uh, frame that question. And that's how I'll frame it in the next episode. Absolutely. Yeah. So, I, and, and I definitely wanted to, uh, as kind of as a way to answer that question, I wanted to look at both the positives and negatives kind of of this view. So sure. the, on the positive side of A, and, and I think this is really kind of maybe go, going more to your question, for those who ascribe to A theory, it, it makes logical sense, right? Like I said, right. we logically want to say, well, yesterday I did this, in the past I did this, or in the future I'll do this. Um, it, it almost kind of follows this, what we call a priori, this, uh, without having to experience it, we just know, um, this a priori reasoning of a now. And so, you know, how does that relate to our thinking as Christians? I I think it helps us to understand that as we move through moment by moment, that God is, is very much present with us. Um, this idea that, you know, things don't truly take him by surprise because he's bigger than events and things like that, but that we are experiencing something shared with him. And 
the calling that we have is a calling that not only is adapted moment to moment on God's view, but also as it relates to us. And so, uh, you know, there is no future that God fears because he is a perfect being. And so as we relate to him in that, just as the future is maybe potentially uncertain or unexistent from a philosophical standpoint, we can adhere to that as well. Um, but I, I think it's also fair to mention equally the challenges that this view potentially uh, would present as well. And I think that the two biggest challenges for this, and um, my former uh, PhD lead and professor is, a, is an advocate for a theory. So he and I have kind of wrestled with this back and forth. But I think the two biggest problems is one, I think it leads to a form of open theism. Um, which open theism, just for those listeners out there may never heard of this, is just the belief that God does not or cannot know the future. Um, the future is left open in a sense. And so God is experiencing these things in such a way that he cannot know them uh, from a true philosophical standpoint. Um, and I think that the second part of that kind of working in conjunction with that is uh, any knowledge that God could have it seems like omniscience would require him to have that. And so since there is such a thing as experiential knowledge, uh, you know, those listeners out there are experiencing this podcast for the first time, probably, um, unless they're repeat listeners. Uh, yeah, listening hopefully before. not, but if so, <laughs> keep listening. Um, but they're experiencing this for the first time. Therefore, they now have experiential knowledge of hearing this and this moment at the same time. Well, if God can have experiential knowledge of anything, it seems like his omniscience would require that. And so since the future doesn't exist, God cannot have experiential knowledge of the future and therefore cannot say he truly knows the future. And that would seem to, at, at times, or, you know, sorry, not at times, as we think about that, that would seem to challenge that idea of omniscience. And yeah. so leading us again i think they feed kind of symbiotically into each other i don't see how an atheist in this regard um can ever truly escape open theism in some way um which we as evangelicals there are some that are open theists i i i kind of find that a little huh, to use your term wonky yeah. um yeah but it's a good term yeah always a good term uh, but I think most evangelicals, especially in our, you know, in the kind of the Baptist world would view that as that's incompatible with how we view God to be. Yeah. That's the main problem I have with the A theory that I see God. And, and you, you mentioned that this, this would uh, compromise God's omniscience, which to me would compromise God's omnipotence. Yes, the, the ability to have control, you know, have control over his creation to create. It just seems like that would be so limiting if you really think it through. And of course, this is a quick 20 to 30 minute podcast. So at some other point, we might try to think it through. But as it stands right now, it's very challenging to see our vision of God. And by the way, it's not just obviously sometimes our vision of the nature of God is too worldly or too informed by non-scriptural sources but i think even our my script my understanding of god through the scriptures just doesn't seem to align with this that's that's one of the, the issues I, I would have with it so Absolutely. yeah but then you know otherwise you can kind of see i mean from our perspective where he, that might be a de decent description of how time happens uh, a couple of things i wanted to mention before we hop off here and and remind everyone to hop on over to the next episode for uh, Paul's uh, professor uh, Paul's description of B. Uh, you mentioned that you had seven verses. What what might be good for folks, uh, Paul, is if you want to just kind of uh, write those down and maybe have a quick annotation of their connection, and then we can pop that up on the blog, uh, so everyone can review that. We're all we'll also have the slide that the side by side does a side by side comparison of the two, just a quick thumbnail sketch for folks to review. The blog again is found at drrobsullivan.com. And if there's any other notes that you want to add, uh, uh, Professor Garber, we can throw those in as well. So I just want to remind folks of that. Uh, 
but otherwise, uh, we thank you for your time. Thank you for listening. Any other thing you want to add before we tell folks go to side B, like they used to say with the old 45s and the old albums? <laughs> uh, no, just uh, thanks for listening and, and really appreciate the time. And I really hope that these things will, if nothing else, get people thinking uh, specifically about their existence and how God relates to them. That's really Absolutely. the bottom line. And they're calling, yeah, and how, yeah, and how, how their their role because we each have this role, right? Right. Uh, and so how that plays in, great. All right, thanks, thanks for listening, everyone, and thank you. Hop guys. on over to side B.